happy Independence Day and the Rakhi Bandhan to all of you. This is truly a privilege for us that we have, sorry, Binat Sanjan Chakraborty, the former Secretary, Ministry of External Affairs, Government of India, in our midst for delivering a lecture in the Vishwabharati Lecture Series on the entire topic, Strategic Imperatives of India-Bangladesh Times in this fire state. I would humbly request our beloved Vice Chancellor, Professor Vikul Chakramurti, our honorable speaker, Sri Sinat Ranjan Chakramurti, and the chairperson of Vishwabharati Lecture Series, Professor Asha Mukherjee, to take seats on the dais. The 10th lecture of Vishwabharati Lecture Series on strategic imperatives of India Bangladesh ties to be delivered by Ambassador Pinak Ranjan Chakravarti. IFS, former Secretary, Ministry of External Affairs, former High Commissioner to Bangladesh, former Ambassador to Thailand, and Visiting Fellow, Observer Research Foundation, a very distinguished diplomat who served Indian Foreign Services for more than four decades. Sri Chakravarti has served at the Ministry of External Affairs, New Delhi, and Indian Mission Abroad, including in Cairo, Jeddah and London. His contributions in developing the international ties with various countries is well recognized. We are extremely grateful to Ambassador Pinak Ranjan Chakravarti for having agreed to the proposal of Ministry of External Affairs to deliver the lecture at Vishwabharati under distinguished lecture series for our students, faculty, and employees. Ambassador Chakravarti's visit was proposed by Ministry of External Affairs almost two years back, but for some reasons it kept on postponing, but finally we are happy to have him with us. Let me share a few words about lecture series. The idea of starting Vishwabharati lecture series is mooted by Professor Vidhu Chakravarti immediately after joining as Vice Chancellor. The objective is to have a platform for dialogue with the really distinguished scholars, researchers, and the best mind of the country and I brought in any field. This is an occasion where we have free exchange of ideas and where we can question each other with respect and enter into dialogue to understand each other's views. A step in tune with the true spirit of Vishwabharati that was emphasized by our founder, Vishwabharati represents India where she has her wealth of mind which is for all. We plan to have distinguished scholars from every field, humanities, sciences, technology, games, films, arts and music, and we have no boundaries of discipline. We started with uh, Professor Dilip Chakravarti's uh, recognized and a very distinguished archaeologist on 5th January 2019. The second was by Professor uh, Vidhu Chakravarti, our dear Vice Chancellor, on February 3rd, 2019. The third by Sri Shokun Dashgupta, MP Raja Shava on 8th March on 2019 and the 4th by Professor Galen Bryan Forbes, State University of New York on March 11th, the 5th by Dr. Sanjeev Sanyal, Principal Economic Advisor to the Government of India, April 5th, the 6th by Ambassador Rajiv Bhatia, Distinguished Fellow, Foreign Studies Program, Ministry of External Affairs. And for a while, in, after April, we had some semester break, examinations, and summer vacations. And after a break, we, were, we are back uh, in August with the seventh lecture in the series, uh, which was on 4th August by Professor Tithankar Roy, London School of Economics. The eighth was on the 8th August by Sri Vivek Devaroy, Chairperson of Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister. And the ninth was on the 30th August by Professor Subhat Bose, Guardian Professor of Persian History and Affairs, Harvard University, on Shadhinata Udesh Bhar. And today we have assembled for the 10th one in the series. We are documenting these lectures with audio and video recording and are available on the Vishwabharati website. We also plan to publish so that these lectures are made available to the larger audience. We all have been anxiously looking forward to Ambassador Binakranjan's Chakravarti's visit 
and lecture. I extend a very hearty welcome to him once again and request uh, Professor Manuel Mukherjee, Director of uh, Bangladesh Bhavan, to introduce the speaker. Thank you. Ambassador Sri Pinak Ranjan Chakraborty, IFS, holds a postgraduate degree in physics and astrophysics from the University of Delhi, having decided not to join an IIT for which he was selected. Sri Chakramurti has served at the Ministry of External Affairs, New Delhi, and Indian missions abroad, including in Cairo, Chetta, and London. He was Consul General of India in Karachi, in 1994 to 1995, and at the Indian Embassy in Tel Aviv from 1995 to 1999. Later, he served as Deputy High Commissioner at Dhaka from 1919 to 2002. He was the Chief of Protocol from 2002 to 2006 and Special Secretary of Public Diplomacy before assuming charge as Secretary Economic Relations. He retired from service on 30th of September 2013. He served as High Commissioner to Bangladesh from 2007 to 2009. From 2010 to 2011, he served as Ambassador to Thailand. During his tenure as High Commissioner to Bangladesh, Sri Chakraborty was instrumental in managing a sensitive phase in bilateral relations arising out of the unstable domestic political situation under the caretaker government in Bangladesh. He mooted the idea of resolving the long festering boundary issue by suggesting changes to the boundary agreement which finally led to a new agreement and subsequent drafting of the Constitution Amendment B. His two tenures in Bangladesh led to the introduction of the first ever direct Dhaka Kolkata bus service and the direct train service between the same two cities. He oversaw the transformation in bilateral relations with the government led by Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina. As ambassador to Thailand, Sri Chakraborty organized visits of two Thai prime ministers and guided the process of investment in BIMSTEC, India-Thailand negotiations on free trade agreement in goods and services and helped increase two-way trade with Thailand. Uh, Professor Bibhul uh, Chakraborty, the Honorable uh, Vice Chancellor of this famous and great university, and uh, Professor Asha Mukherjee, who's been coordinating everything uh, right from phone calls and WhatsApp messages and all kinds of things. And I'm delighted to be here, and of course, distinguished uh, uh, faculty members, students who've taken the trouble to come here to listen to me. Uh, it's always a difficult task. I've been here before. I mean, I've been here as, uh, as a, when I was the High Commissioner in, uh, in Bangladesh. But I came again for another lecture once, uh, some years ago. And uh, I'm uh, delighted to be here on Independence Day and Raksha Bandhan. Uh, I've never had a Raki tied on me because I am a single sibling. I don't have brothers and sisters. <laughs> I mean, my own. Otherwise, there are cousins and others. So uh, it was delightful to be here and join all the events today. Now, uh, my lecture will, will not be very technical. I will not try to make it very technical. Bidu Babu keeps telling me, I'm going to Bangla, I'm going to Bangla, I'm going to Bangla. You know, I grew up in Dehradun, uh, I was born in Lucknow. When I went to school in Dehradun, so my first language was actually Hindi, apart from the Bengali we spoke at home. But I must tell you that I did learn Bengali during my summer vacation, and it was on the insistence of my parents that I did. So I Bangla, Bangla, 
what happened was that when I was uh, in Dhaka, I found that uh, that it was very difficult to not to s speak, uh, give public uh, sort of addresses in English. In English, nobody understood. So, so that's where I started actually my uh, my second term in learning Bengali. Anyway, that's another story, which I'll come to later. Maybe just to tell you that when I used to visit uh, Prime Minister Hasina for various, uh, you know, communicating messages, talking to her, discussing, taking her guidance, she told me once very clearly that Vinak Babu, I am to apna shate English jite kotha bolbo. So I am like, our je mukte kara che kimba adar kara che. So jo sheta ami jani na apni Bangali, ami apna shate shudhu Bangali. I said, okay, man, there's no problem, we can converse like that. There are anecdotes such as a question. But let me get to the, let get to what we are uh, trying to understand here, which is the strategic imperatives in India, Bangladesh ties. Uh, I've tried to structure this uh, talk in sort of kind of uh, talk, talk about what is strategic, um, why do we say uh, we are uh, so and so country is in our strategic neighborhood? And then I focus a bit on bilateral ties, how they have been transformed between India and Bangladesh. So, what do we um, uh, let me begin with uh, what I what we what is a strategic neighborhood? What is the overarching uh, concept of, uh, uh, of of neighborhood? Is it mere geography and shared borders, or is it beyond that? I think one of the first attempts to understand this was by uh, Chanakya in his, uh, <coughs> in his famous uh, Artha Shastra, uh, that he talked about what is known as the Mandala concept, which is like concentric circles of goes out from where you are. I mean, there were no fixed borders there, but when you go out like that, the first concentric circle would be your neighbors, and the next would be your neighbor's neighbor, and so on. So in terms of uh, defining a neighborhood uh, in a strategic sense, Chanakya's contribution is very significant in terms of how to deal with neighbors. And you know all that, you know about it. Your neighbor will be a potential enemy, and your country beyond your neighbor will be a potential friend. Now when we come into the Westphalia era, as we call after the Treaty of Westphalia 1648, where we, we go into what is more, what we now call the nation states, where nations are defined by boundaries, by fixed boundaries, and that's how the world has developed since then. Now, what do we, so we clearly then identify a country by a border, by a geographical space bound by. But is it only geography that, uh, that defines uh, strategic? Now, Halford Mackinders, the famous British geographer, wrote a paper in 1904, The Geographical Pivot of History, based his thesis on the Heartland Theory. Now, this, is, this was a strategic concept that he developed, the Heartland Theory, that the world will be dominated by any power or any country which controls the Eurasian landmass. Eurasia means from Asia to Europe. The biggest landmass on our planet is the Eurasian landmass. And then he, uh, then he uh, said that, uh, that this is what uh, should define, and he used, though he himself didn't use the term, but it came to be used after him, or geopolitics. So geography and politics get combined into what is called geopolitics. Then, of course, came uh, another uh, thinker and writer, but this time an American, Alfred T. Bahan, who wrote a famous treatise called The Influence of Sea Power Upon History, 1660 to 1783, History of Naval Warfare, published 1890. So he changes this geographical paradigm from land into the maritime domain. That is basically his simple thesis was that uh, you have to control the maritime domain of the seas and the oceans to become a global power, which is what ultimately America did in terms of, uh, and he was an American who used to teach at the uh, US Naval War College. And this book is, a, is kind of a Bible for all Navy officers. They all read this book. 
because it, uh, it defines what is maritime, how to deal with the maritime. But anyway, these theories are all in the context of the In the context of that era, you know, the late uh, 19th century, early 20th century, lots of things were happening on the global stage. Now, in a sense, uh, uh, in a geographical sense, both the USA and UK functioned as islands in, in some terms of their geographical thing, and USA because it was separated by the Atlantic and away from the old world. So they both functioned, in a sense, as islands. And I'm going to show you some maps, which basically, I don't know, I personally always look at maps to understand what is geopolitics? Why this country is acting like this? Or why this country is behaving like this? What are its demands? What are its interests? I think geography plays a huge role in it. If, if, if any of you have, uh, have the time, you should read uh, uh, Richard Kaplan's book called The Revenge of Geography. It's a very interesting book that you, is uh, worth reading. Now, this is, this is Asia. This is, this is Asia. And the other part is Europe, that grey part across Europe. So when you see Eurasia, you can imagine that this is the mass that Mackinder was talking about. India, <coughs> that is our focus. Here are the Sakhdarma countries. You can see the extent where it goes. India's neighborhood, this is India. These are the neighbors, immediate neighbors. Neighborhood can also be Southeast Asia. After all, we have a, a continuity, contiguity with uh, Myanmar and now towards the, the, land, the land continuity right up to uh, Malaysia. When we talk about the maritime area, here is the symbol of the Indian Ocean Naval Conference, Naval Symposium, which shows where, where they think our maritime domains. This is where it's more clearly defined, basically, the Indian Ocean Maritime Zone. So these are the areas geographically that the strategists and, and policy makers, when we sit down and we discuss, we have to keep these things in As I said, is neighborhood simply another geography? But from here, there is a border, there is another geography, a domain, another geographical space. I think, in my view, that your strategic neighborhood need not be your simply a neighbor. It can mean a geographical space anywhere where something happens and it impinges on your national security. I'll explain what, what I'm trying to say. Like, for example, let's go back to Mughal times when uh, Babur came from uh, the Fargana Valley in Uzbekistan. He came from another geography. And he came, uh, there, was no, there was no contiguity at that time between India and what is today Uzbekistan. At that time it was the, the Khanate or something. So he ran away because he was being pursued by his uncle. He came here and you know history, what happened after that. So, you know, geographies can mean different things in terms of history also. <clears throat> so in other words, if that geography has a strategic impact on India, because it changed the face of India, you had the Mughal Empire established over 300 years, it ruled for 300 years, so that had, has a strategic impact on us. West Asia, let me go now a little west, where beyond Afghanistan to Iran and all. They all had strategic impact on India in the early days. Today, what kind of strategic impact they are having on us? Anyone? They supply 80% of this our is, energy. This is energy, the scooter you ride, the bus you take, the gas you use, 80% of India's energy is imported <coughs> from these regions. So it has a strategic impact on us in terms of if the price of oil goes up to $150, you won't be driving a scooter anymore. You think twice. 
that is the kind of strategic impact that a geography can have, another geography, through the medium of a commodity. Oh, like an oil, for example, or gas. For example, let me go to Southeast Asia and show it to the map. You know Southeast Asia. Very interesting, because we have a strategic impact on Southeast Asia and the whole of Asia. Through what? Through Buddhism, through trade, through Hinduism, etc. I served in Thailand where I was always uh, extremely curious to know their country and how they function. The last king of Thailand, his name was Bhumi Bal Atullatej. Written in English in like Bhumi Bal Atullatej or something. But actually his name is Bhumi Bal Atullatej. When you pass his name, this is his name. Even today, the king of Thailand uses the name of Ram. The current king is Ram the Tenth of the Chakri dynasty, which is what the, the dynasty which has been ruling for about the last uh, 60 years or something. So the impact of strategic impact of India or, uh, on these countries is extremely interesting. If Indonesia you take Borobudu, one of the big one of the most fabulous sites of Buddhist architecture, or Brahmanen, in, uh, which, is the, which has hundreds of Hindu temples. And this, these are sites to see. Then, of course, you have uh, the place in Cambodia, Siem Reap, the Angkor Wat, those temples. I mean, these are you know, strategic kind of buildings that Indians built there, most, mostly by Indians. Of course, there were local dynasties. Even up to Korea, the Koreans have this famous story that one of their princes in the early 7th, 6th to 7th centuries married a prince, I don't know, a prince or a princess from Ayodhya. I don't know, this is a, either a myth or a, either real history or a story. But they stick to it. They, they have these things. They stick to it. Go to Japan, go to China. China, when Atish Dipankar went to, to China, he took Buddhism and everything there. So in a sense, Asia was impacted by India in a very strategic way. And that is through religion and culture. So the term strategic should not be just understood in terms of I have, you know, 20, you know, 2,000 missiles and 5,000 tanks. That is not strategic. There is something more to strategic. And that is why today, when we talk of national security, we include everything. That's why terms today are mean energy security. How do you secure your energy supplies? Anything. You can call anything security today. You can build, it, build a security paradigm. since we are so interconnected that everybody has a strategic impact on, on, on somebody. Today Trump is fighting a trade war with China. It's having a strategic impact on, on China, although, although America is not China's neighbor. So a strategic neighborhood, when you say neighborhood, constantly you think, oh, our neighboring country. Not necessarily. There is a global neighborhood. And that is what we are trying to, you know, change the thinking processes with how you think about strategies and strategic issues. A small country in Latin America can mount a cyber attack on India or any other country. Now, you, let's say somebody sitting in Chile can do it today, mount a cyber attack and say, knock on your uh, electronic grid or something else, there are many other things can be done. So is that a strategic threat to you? It is. Although Chile or Peru or I'm, I'm just taking these names randomly, they don't, don't mean it. Are so far away from us that we don't even think about them <coughs> in our daily life. <coughs> but in our own neighborhood, I think uh, there is without doubt that geopolitically and geoeconomically, the rise of China, the economic rise of China has clearly change the landscape to such an extent that we are still trying to cope with how to deal with it. 
how, how to deal with China's rise. Because uh, uh, this is something that we did not expect. Uh, so this was a strategic kind of uh, challenge that uh, almost all countries are facing, anybody who has to deal with China. Now, today you can imagine that uh, our trade with China is going to be of the order of about 100 billion, of which about 60 odd billion, or let's say 65 odd billion, uh, is the trade deficit. That is, they export so much more to us, and we export less to them, so much less to them. So the gap is about 60, 70 billion. So this is the kind of scale that we are talking about. Although the scale with America is much more, but this is a very important scale. Now, this is, we regard this as strategic. Why? We have differences with China. But is China going to, let us say, is China going to suffer the consequences of any drastic action and disrupt this trade? Possibly not. So these are the calculations that go in how you deal with China. Would China upset this whole thing? Because they are profiting from it so much. Why would China upset this? paradigm or upset this image. So these are some of the things that one has to now take into account, apart from who is a neighbor, etc. You've seen, uh, for example, uh, our neighbors uh, using China, we call it playing the China card, Bangladesh, everybody does it to some extent or the other. Pakistan is probably the most extreme case. Sri Lanka is also there, so is Bangladesh, they all do. I'll come back to it, how so the China factor is now looming very large in terms of our own strategic thinking, our strategic neighborhood, and our own strategic space, as we call it, including the maritime zone. Pressures are growing. You saw how Brooklyn happened, and how he reacted, uh, in how he tried to tell China, convey a message to China, that, you know, you can't do this. Because this is our strategic space here. You can't come in like this. So these are the messaging that goes on. Fortunately, we don't uh, shoot at each other. Basically, what happens is, and it's very interesting, I don't know whether you've seen some videos of it, that uh, the Chinese come in, and then our soldiers go there, and then they push them like this. You know, they hit them like this and like that, and they push them. So it goes on like that, basically. But nobody really fires a bullet so that there is that understanding. And uh, <coughs> then the Chinese go back. Then uh, I don't think I'm letting out any uh, national secret here, but we do the same where we can. It's all a question of opportunity and sending a message. And let me tell you, our Jats and Sikhs are much bigger than the Chinese. So they don't stand a chance in terms of pushing. But that's another story. Now, what are the neighborhood challenges when you talk about the real neighborhood? What is, what is India's foreign policy goal? Apart from protecting the territory, the borders, etc. The strategic goal is to transform India into a prosperous and developed nation. That is the ultimate goal, both of domestic and foreign policy. And they have to work together to achieve it. <laughs> That is how it works. And for that, you need a peaceful periphery. You don't need wars and troubles, etc. I mean, that's the idealized situation, but it doesn't happen on the ground. Now, today, uh, China and Pakistan, I think it's very well known, propose the maximum strategic channel cha challenges to India in our neighborhood. Whereas things ha are happening, we're all reading about it Article 370, Kapadu Corridor and why each side is doing it, but that, that is a subject that you can talk about for hours and so So I put down some points here, for example, how, how, how uh, Trump is trying to manage the, its own strategy vis-a-vis -vis Iran, how it's trying to squeeze Iran. Why, you might ask, why is, why is Iran so important for, for America that it has to put sanctions? Obviously, from their point of view, it is important because of Israel, because of uh, because of 
the fact that Iran supports the anti, some of their uh, Arab forces in that region, Hezbollah, Hamas, Yemen, the Houthis and all that. So there's a war going on in Yemen. And finally, I, I, currently I think the Iran also poses a, poses a ideological challenge to the Sunni world, to Iran and Shia. So they pose an ideological challenge to the Sunni world. So that itself is also a fact. What are the other uh, uh, things that India is worried about as far as West Asia is concerned in that region? I've talked about oil. The other thing is the diaspora. Diaspora meaning about 7, 8 million Indians work there. And these are people who send in about 48 billion in remittances into our reserves. Now that's a strategic uh, amount for us in terms of building up our reserves and so that our currency, etc., can be backed up by investors. So I think that, so when you again talk about strategic, all these issues come. It is not merely, you know, a sense of you know, military or something. There are economic reasons, there's energy security I talked about, then there is uh, maritime challenges also, because somebody can come from the maritime zone. The Rohingya crisis is also a strategic challenge, for example. The illegal migration is a strategic challenge. How do we deal with it? We still haven't found answers to illegal migration. We're still trying to see the NRC being done. What will, we, what will you do? Even after you finish the NRC, these are questions, these are very strategic questions. If, like, if let's say, for the sake of argument, that you have two crores of people outside the NRC, so they have become stateless. They are not Indian citizens. They are declared as not Indian citizens. What do we do? Any answers? We will be happy to take some answers back to Delhi. This is, this is a huge challenge for the country. What do we do with these people? We can't push them into Bangladesh because that would mean our relations with Bangladesh will collapse. They can't take them also because they don't have that kind of capacity. So what do we do with them? I, leave them. I can address the question separately, but I leave it there for you to think about. Now, maritime uh, <coughs> arena today is becoming as uh, as important as the land-based arena. To go back to Mahinder and uh, Mahan, where the, where the two you know, concepts uh, were in uh, conflict as to whether you should control land first or the maritime first. But today, maritime is taking the, sometimes taking the upper hand. Why? Do you know how much percentage of global trade goes through the maritime zone? What we call the sea lines of communication? Almost 80%. 80% of global trade flows through the maritime arena. And which is where you can disrupt. Why do you think America has a base in Rio de Why do you think we are developing some kind of military facilities in uh, Mauritius or Seychelles. We are trying to do that also. Why do, we, why do you think we have a uh, tri-services uh, command in the Andamans? So these are all strategic, very strategic islands in the, in the maritime arena of the Indian Ocean, where, by the way, much of the traffic goes, oil traffic, we are, the, we are one of the biggest buyers of oil. China is, Japan is, Korea is. The largest economy is in Asia. This is where the oil flows, the goods flow, everything. Imagine what would happen if this flow is restricted or impeded or blocked. It will have a huge strategic impact on all these countries. So the maritime zone, that's why, has, been, has come up in terms of its strategic importance than earlier, what it was thought so earlier. Primarily also because of the rise of China. Because China is now coming into the Indian Ocean in a big way. You know about Hamban Kota, I don't know how many of you read about it. the port that China built in Sri Lanka. The Sri Lanka is now handed over to China for a 99 year lease. What will China do to that port? So anyway, China has, will not do much because we have ensured that it, it can be used only for civilian sort of purposes. But Gwadar is there, China wants to come into the... Uh, imagine the map of where India is and China here. One hour 
of China is coming to Pakistan in the water. Why? It wants access into the Arabians. The other thing that we are trying very hard is to come through into the Bay of Bengal. Either through Myanmar, it's not happening because Myanmar is are not cooperating to the fullest extent. But they are building in Chok Poos, there is a port in southern Myanmar where they are building a harbor and a port, etc. We are also trying to the Kalanan Highway and the Kalanan Corridor to get into uh, from, from our northeast into through, through Myanmar into the Bay. So there is this contest going on. Because when a power rises, when there is stability and there is one global power which is like the which was America, so we were all part of that system which grew up after, 19, uh, after the Second World War. What is known as the Bretton Woods system and things like that. Dollar being the international currency, IMF, World Bank, UN, all these structures were built as part of that system, international system, where we also joined. So did China. But what is happening today, as uh, that famous uh, Greek historian wrote about the war between Troy and Sparta, that, uh, that when one power rises the other, and, and there is an established power, then war is inevitable. I mean, that was during in Greek history. But then today, is war inevitable? Do we strategize for war? Is it inevitable because China is rising? The answer is no. War is not inevitable. Because today, it's no longer Greek history. Because today, we are in the age of nuclear weapons. And most of the big powers have nuclear weapons. And nobody is going to risk complete destruction. There will be conflicts, but there will be managed conflicts. What we call managed conflicts, which does not cross Session. But today the international landscape is fluid, uncertain, and India also has strategic opportunities in this fluidity. Because if you are looking for to establish what we call a multipolar world, in the sense that there will be five or six great powers managing world affairs. The rest, smaller powers will have to fall in line. It's as simple as that. This is the hard reality of international politics. But that system is still not in place. To replace the system of American hegemony that we have seen so far after the Second World War. So that is the space we are in at today. And it will remain, you know, this context will, contest will go on for some more time till it settles into some kind of a understanding between the two powers. One other concept that I thought of and I thought I'd leave the thought with you that is space and outer space a geographical concept? <coughs> it is a space, it's not land. Just like water is not land. But space is also a geographical, I mean, a space is also can be strategic. And I can't think of a more strategic space than space. Why? The, the number of satellites in space watching all of us, you know, they can even see you walking in China. I mean, it's possible, you know. So that's another very strategic arena where you get a lot of information and intelligence about activities going on all around the world, depending on how much, uh, how many satellites you have, how good your technology is, and things like that. Now, obviously, the Americans have the best, the Russians, China, we also have. We also have enough fair amount of satellites, both communication and lower satellites, lower satellites which uh, look down and map things. You know. But ultimately, when you come down to the bottom line, we have to have economic muscle to plan strategy at least a global <coughs> And that economic muscle will only come from economic growth, which is domestic economic growth, through whichever means, trade, investments, etc. Our GDP has to grow to provide those extra you know, money for these kind of activities. Without that, we cannot become a global power. Hence, 
the economy, as during the Clinton campaign they said, what's the problem? They said, it's the economy is stupid. That without that, you are not unable to fulfill your aspirations or dreams for anything. I told you that by the Sahasita told you that she would only talk to me in Bengali. When I reached uh, Bangladesh in 2007, within uh, a few days uh, there was a, this uh, political upheaval, which it was called the you know, Bangladesh has a system where uh, before an election, when the five years are over, before the five years are over, uh, caretaker government takes over for three months. And they conduct the election. Now there is a there is a whole thing as to how to select the caretaker government. What happened was at that time that uh, the BNP Jamaat government, which was hanging over reins of the government, uh, could not agree with the Awami League as to what kind of caretaker government we should have. So they went and unilaterally did a caretaker government, which was headed by a president, their president at that time, one Mr. E.R. Jyoti. And what happened was that the Awami League was very unhappy, and, what, and it was being manipulated to such an extent that the army stepped in, basically. The army stepped in, went to the president and said, that this caretaker government is not, not, not acceptable. Let's have a more neutral caretaker. So they actually untwisted that. It was like a coup, almost like a coup, except that the general uh, Moin uh, Ahmed didn't actually become the president. So they were good, trying to do things from the background. And uh, so this is the time when I went in there. And uh, then there was one famous well-known economist, Dr. Fakhruti Nayman, he became the head of the caretaker government. He's a U.S. trained uh, world bank, you know, that kind of place. And there were, they, they picked up fairly neutral people who were economists or diplomats, uh, and they became the caretaker This was the situation when I went in. And the army decided, General Boyd, that uh, they will not have elections. They will postpone elections. I mean, this was all pretty unconstitutional, but uh, it was happening in my own And so he started a campaign to eliminate uh, Prime Minister Hasina and Begum Khalid Azia, the two prime leaders who been prime minister in the rotation. But what happened was that uh, he put them in jail, saying that, uh, and they, he called it the minus two formula. Minus two means these two women will not be allowed to leaders to, to do politics anymore. So he put them in. And he tried what we used to call then a kind of a political engineering to set up new uh, parties. They got in, uh, you know, the Nobel laureate uh, uh, Professor Yunus to form a party. You know, he thought he would try and get in good people into politics. It was all a very noble idea. But it didn't work. Because, uh, you know, it's not easy to build a party uh, to oppose the BNP and the Awami League, which are older parties who who been in government, who know the know the background, who know the know the people, etc. So what happened was that after trying for a lot of time, uh, and I was then the High Commissioner, and it was my I was tasked to see as to how you can bring this to a successful end. That was my my task given to me from Delhi. So I had to deal with General Moin a lot. And one day he told me, and I used to talk to him, and, so he said, Hi Commissioner, come. You don't have to come through the government. Come straight to me whenever you have anything. Because he was feeling powerful that he could do things, etc. So I used to go to him and used to talk a lot. And, so, and then one day he told me, Hi Commissioner, please remember that, um, uh, that I am from the first batch of the Bangladesh Military Academy. So I said, I understand why you are saying this. Can you tell him why? And I knew why he was saying Basically, he was saying, if you look, there are no Pakistani trained officers anymore in the upper echelons of the Bangladesh Army. Because earlier, most, many of the generals were you know, trained there. They had served in the Pakistan Army. 
and they had a different mindset. You can imagine what kind of mindset they had. So I think this was one of the things that we, so we saw this as a great opportunity to, uh, to help Bangladesh to go for election. And finally he agreed, because one day we were chatting, I said, he tells boy, you won't be able to do this minus two business. So he says, what should I do? I said, well, have a good election and um, let all parties participate. But you make sure that it's free and fair. That much you can have. Ultimately, that is what happened in 2008. Uh, I was not But that, I was digressing. I was giving you a little anecdote. But let's see. Let's have a look at another map. You see where Bangladesh is? That's not if you were sitting in Dhaka and looking at this map, what would you think? If you are a policy maker sitting in Dhaka and looking at this map, where you can see Bangladesh is surrounded by India with a very small area down there with Myanmar. I think less than what 70 odd kilometers. How would the government or any thinker or policy maker in Bangladesh look at its own geography and decide. I think the answer is very clear. No, ans simple answer is that don't take Panga with India. I mean to put it through here. That if you are friends with India, it will be beneficial to you. This is what Hasina understood and made that strategic leap of faith to have good relations. And she, uh, and, and what is the result? It's just another map to show how uh, our northeastern states are impacted by the geography of Bangladesh. Why we, why we strategize about it? Why we strategize about Bangladesh? Why are there strategic imperatives for our relations with, with Bangladesh? This is one of the reasons, the northeastern states and our access to it. No industry wants to go there. Because of the problems of going all the way around Bangladesh, it adds a lot to the cost. What we call the chicken's neck. You see that little part? Where Bangladesh comes close to the heart? This we call the chicken's neck. Because it can be throttled at any time. And your northeast will get cut off. I mean, these are all theoretical, but but in strategy, you have to take it into account. What happened? Why did Dokyam happen? You know what Dokyam is? Dokyam is somewhere here. Sorry. It's somewhere here. And it abuts this that little place. And we didn't want the Chinese sitting here on the high ground looking over this place. That's why we pushed them back. As I said, uh, Andhra Sheikh Hasina, who is now in her third term, third five-year term, which means she's been in power for two decades, and this is the third decade that she started. And the elections were in uh, 2018, when she came back with a thumping majority. There are, of course, a lot of uh, uh, complaints about the election and things like that. But I think, as I say, Bangladesh's geographical location makes it inevitable that its strategic policy choices will intersect with that of India's and there will be some points of disagreements. Because of the, the geography, the way where Bangladesh is located, if it makes some choices that, are, that goes against our strategic interests, so there will be disagreement. But converging agreements are also very important. Converging interests, right? Largely on economic and connectivity ties, which now today dominate the relationship. One of the things that we told Bangladesh that, uh, look, in 65, the Pakistanis, after the war, cut off all the railway links. And it was not that Bangladesh was not connected with the railway grid. During British times, it was. There were several points of connectivities. Trains used to go through Bangladesh to other parts of uh, India or come from other parts and come through other so we, 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 we told them that, look, this is one project we can do. We reconnect the railways. 
This is a connectivity which is important for everybody, for people traveling, etc. And we were also telling that, that Bangladeshi are traveling more and more to India. And today, the Bangladeshi travelers to India form the largest number of foreign travelers to India. This is a fact. So that's one of the things that we were trying. The connectivity also gives us strategic options in going through Bangladesh, which we call transit. <coughs> Apart from the bonds of civilization, language, shared history, etc., our role in the 71 war, a high level engagement has also become irrevocable and irreversible because there is a consensus now built up in both countries that good relations with Bangladesh in the, is in the interest of each country. Bangladesh is today prospering. And Bangladesh is becoming a more and more a pivot in our look east policy or act east policy. How to integrate Bangladesh when we think of integrating with the east through Myanmar and other things? Because of this geography where Bangladesh sits in between, it is important for us to think of it as, as, a, as a point of connectivity with Myanmar and other countries towards the And hence we are, we have a trilateral highway project between India, Myanmar and Thailand. Now I've seen it from the Thai end where the roads are good, etc. But Myanmar is not good, the Indian side is we are building the roads. Now imagine you can actually drive from Delhi or wherever uh, through that thing right up to Vietnam. That's the kind of connectivity we have has been conceived of. We are trying to see whether we can do it. Now, because of the choice that Sheikh Hasina finally made, that uh, no, I must uh, remove most of the irritants with India, which was basically due with Ulfa and the insurgencies that they went places there. So she she gave directions that all these fellows should be sent back. So that created a different uh, kind of uh, uh, trust, as we say, in the relationship. So the trust, when the trust grew, we also became more generous in terms of helping Bangladesh. Our maximum uh, aid, what we give in terms of our technical and other aid, is to Bangladesh. And today it stands at about 8 billion. I mean, we are not competing with China. China is offering 30 billion dollars or 35 billion dollars. But we still have, uh, we still give a sizable amount of aid. Railways is one sector. There are various other sectors, hospitals, clinics, <coughs> which are being built with Indian money. To encourage Bangladesh, we also opened up trade. We uh, we gave them what is called the duty free access as a least developed country. So, Bangladeshi goods, when they come into India, are zero tariff, tariff means customs and all. Zero tariff, they pay local tariff, local taxes in a state or something, but zero tariff on almost, almost anything except negative items. Negative items means uh, banned items, narcotic drugs, etc. Et <coughs> so, that is led to Bangladesh's trade jumping to almost a billion. I think it's reaching a billion dollars. And it used to languish at about 150 million, about five, ten, five, six years. So those are the kind of things that are happening with Bangladesh. The other thing, of course, which is now becoming more important, I've talked about cyberspace. And that is another domain. The rest of it is general. The internet gateway from Cox's Bazaar, for example, in Bangladesh to Agartala and Tripura uh, is, is a major factor because internet access was very poor in the northeastern states. But it was easier to get it through Bangladesh because Cox's Bazaar, the underground submarine cables come and end there. You know, everybody has a, what we call the gateways. Each country has a gateway. Ours is in Bombay where all your internet actually comes through those cables and the sea cables. So this is one thing which we did, and which has improved the northeastern access, including in terms of banking and other things, in terms of connectivity. 
So Bangladesh has helped us there. And we, we, we gave them money for it. We actually built those cables and took it from there into the industry. The second, of course, is the participation in the nuclear power project. Now, new, the nuclear domain is always regarded as strategic because it is uh, it's a domain where there's nothing tactical, it is all strategic because of the kind of the nature of the uh, project. But this is about power. It is a Russian, uh, India, a Bangladesh project. We are now more or less now getting into uh, getting into uh, more detailed kind of uh, what we call granular kind of relationships. Now we have an MOU between the CBI and the Anti-Corruption Commission to help each other. Because of the nature of our relationship, the border, etc., those who are corrupt, say in Bangladesh, tend to send the money to somebody here and park it in India. I don't know how many of Indians do that, but certainly Bangladeshis do, and we have found out. So that's that they wanted some help on that. So we signed this agreement that CBI is going to help you track down some of these people. Then, then good governance, training for their uh, they bureaucrats. Now we have trained, I think, more than uh, 2,000 bureaucrats in India. Now for us, it's a strategic investment. You can understand, if I can get 2,000 uh, Bangladeshi bureaucrats to India and train them and show them around India and make them understand India, they are going to be an asset when they, when they join the service, etc. So we're trying to build those kind of relationships which will be long-lasting in terms of cooperation with and we are building that human sort of uh, resource and assets that will help us when that person, for example, rises up in the hierarchy. So these are very long-term things that uh, uh, don't talk about it too much outside. These are the various other things, medicinal plants, fisheries. You know, it's becoming more as if, uh, as if uh, you know, you are getting down to real <laughs> basics. You know, fisheries, how to, how to so Bangladesh today is situated in, a, in, a, in India's strategic space in a manner which is very positive in the sense that we are cooperating in all these things. We are now even offering defense equipment, $500 million of uh, what we call the line of credit which they can use to buy things from India. So all these things are happening at the moment. But now to go to a bit of the economic track, I think I, uh, I have some time. I think five minutes. Yes, I'll yeah. finish in five minutes. Uh, it's remarkable that Bangladesh is now track, on track to overtake Pakistan's GDP per capita this year. I mean, this is an absolutely fabulous development in the sense that where, where is Pakistan? It shows where Pakistan is today and where how Bangladesh has risen. It's remarkable for a country that was once the poorest in South Asia and suffered egregious exploitation by the governing elite in West Pakistan. But after the 71 independence, Bangladesh, they struggled for 10, 12, 20 years, but today they have been very well. Their population control methods are better, even better than ours. They have managed to control population so well. The growth rate, uh, I think uh, last year or this year, Bangladesh's GDP growth rate will exceed that of India in terms of percentage. So that is one more thing that's going to happen. The World Bank says that per capita income has almost reached the USD $1750, which is a very, uh, fairly impressive thing, very impressive, because earlier it used to languish way below. Poverty line defined by World Bank as 1.25 US dollars per day has gone down to less than 9% of the population in Bangladesh. And Bangladesh is today will become what we call we graduate out of the LDC status. These are economic terms at the world level where, a, where an LDC means the least developed nation. They get some extra facilities in terms of time. But Bangladesh is reaching a stage where it will have to come out of that. Now here is the Bangladesh GDP growth in the last uh, few years. It is 
now reaching about $250 billion. The ADB also has designated Bangladesh as the fastest growing economy in the Asia Pacific region, likely to achieve 8% GDP growth. This is absolutely fantastic. This is, I mean, nobody ever thought this could happen. Negative sides are there corruption, ease of doing business, poor banking regulations, you know, the same things that happen in India also are there, maybe a little more and a little less. Now here's the regional GDP growth outlook and see where the other questions. This is ADP source. Now institutions. So we have over the years tried to build over now today almost a hundred uh, uh, institutions and sub institutions exist. And you think of any domain, but there is some agreement with Bangladesh, and we are trying to do things together. Power is the most latest thing. And here I will tell you a small story again, which and how it started. After the 2008 win of uh, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, I went to congratulate her. And uh, so we were sitting and chatting. And so I said, um, um, Prime Minister, you must be planning a visit to Delhi. You would like you to come to Delhi. You've just been re-elected. So, and uh, what would you like uh, you know, that I can do for you? So she looks at me and says that, give me power. I said, what do you mean power? She says, electricity. I want electricity. So I said, Prime Minister, how can I give you electricity? Our grids are not even connected. But that's your problem. You go and sort this out. But I need electricity. There was a major, you know, those days, uh, what do you call it? Lockout. Hmm? What is it? Blackouts. Load shed, uh, load shed, sorry, load shedding. That was the word I was looking for. Load shedding uh, those days. And she was really concerned because the industry was suffering. And it was, uh, that set me off because that became my whole time job almost. How to, how to get India to cooperate with Bangladesh to first achieve grid connectivity. So I managed. I convinced everybody in Delhi that this is what she wants. And we were not exactly very surplus, but we did have some surplus in the eastern zone. So, and, and I explained to them that this is something that the Prime Minister is asking and we should give, you know, somehow from somewhere. But it required great connectivity. So then lots of comings and goings. And finally we selected the two places, one in West Bengal and the other in Bangladesh, where the two grids came very close to each other along the border. And that is how this place was selected. But here we can do it uh, more efficiently. I think it's called uh, uh, Behampur. Behampur and Dheramara on the other side. So, and that's how it started. The first 500 megawatts was given. And then we also permitted them to buy uh, from the Indian electricity pool on payment. But others was also at a subsidized price. Today that grid uh, will, uh, has been expanded to take almost 1200 megawatts. And we're also trying to connect it uh, on the east with Tripura, another grid connectivity there, where gas, where the gas, Jalpallatana gas plant is coming up in a big, has come up in a big way. So then what happened was that the Pallatana gas, gas plant that we were building in Tripura, which has gas, was getting into a problem because what we call the, the turbines, the gas turbines, which actually build the electricity or generate electricity, they were so big, huge turbines, that we were finding it difficult to take it all the way around by land and by road. So that became another task. So finally, I convinced them that, you know, please allow it, us to take it through Bangladesh. How? On barges. You know, on maritime, through the maritime river I include. Because that's easier, we have big barges, and you can put these turbines on these barges. And finally, we took it up through the uh, Bangladesh, the rivers, and took it very close to Agartala. There is a place there where we actually paid to build a jetty, paid to build a road to take this by road to Palata. We had, we paid for it, that we, we had to pay. But at the end of it, the strategic uh, concept was that I get connectivity through the river and road right up to Agartala. And I can use it. So these are some of the factors how we 
we got Bangladesh to agree to some of these things. Now, of course, lots of projects are going on now. There, is, there are, in fact, 3,600 megawatt of power projects under implementation by Indian companies now in Bangladesh. Investments, uh, we, we have another innovative thing with Bangladesh, which is called the which is called the border hearts. I don't know if you've ever heard seen. There used to be, when India was not uh, divided, uh, people from both sides used to congregate in certain places and do hearts, where I would come sell my thing, somebody else would come and sell my thing. But once the line was drawn, those things fell into disuse. So we thought, why not start border hearts all over again? It's a very innovative way of for getting people to trade. Again, we sat with them, explained the way of the grief. Today, we have over six border hearts which are functioning. Small things, they don't make such a huge dent in the trade, but local people uh, tend to benefit from it. Because, you know, they don't have to go far away, they just can sit there and sort of do all these things. But this is another factor that you can't, you can't do it with other, other countries, but you can do it with Bangladesh because it was they want it, we want it, so that's the kind of thing. So what we're saying is that we are also focusing on what we call people-centric arrangements. How to help the people on the ground. Because well, the border is a difficult place. Uh, smuggling, cattle smuggling, all kinds of uh, proper, uh, dif uh, difficult things happen. Trade pattern, of course, has uh, changed, as I have talked about. And there are now, uh, India exports are more than $10 billion. In fact, Bangladesh is our largest uh, trading partner in South Asia. Nobody else comes any close. So that's another strategic factor why we want to maintain good relations, why we want to carry on with all these things. Development partnership, eight billion dollars. Capacity building, scholarships, cultural uh, things, medical treatment, all these things we provide. And we uh, encourage them to come to India for medical treatment. We have a medical visa also now, a category called medical visa. And Bangladesh is on the highest travelers, number of travelers uh, to India. What are the future challenges? I think uh, infrastructure, connectivity, illegal migration, <coughs> border management, all these things, terrorism and, and radical, uh, you know, religious kind of thing, Islamic uh, radicalism, all these are challenges. Climate change is emerging as a future challenge, and I think this we'll have to look into it. The Sundarban is being affected very badly is something that we are trying to again do some kind of a joint uh, sort of uh, look at it and see how we can. And obviously Bangladesh is a very important partner in BIMSTEC. Now we have taken a strategic decision that SARC is no longer viable for us. We will do with BIMSTEC what we have failed to do with SARC. So that is where we stand today and the future looks promising at least as far as Bangladesh is concerned. And thank you. The first one is, uh, while seeing the GDP growth rate of Bangladesh, we notice that there is a sharp increase in the graph of 1975. It reaches a peak and then it falls down. What was the reason for that? In 75? 75. Are you sure? 75? Sure? Yes, yes, we saw. And another question. Um, in the matter of the Rohingya crisis, we see that they are not getting place in any of the country's government. But if we do something like this, then all the uh, the world government takes an, an initiative and they distribute the Rohingya population or the refugee population among themselves, they will serve as a human assets. Or do you think that this is the liability or the asset for them? Thank you, sir. Anyone? Well, something. 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 Sir, I have two questions. One is from the from first part of your lecture and second 
one from the second part of the lecture. The first part, so how India is strategically affected by constructing by China and Pakistan the sea belt, and how it is nullified by controlling Chabahar with Iran and India. That, this is my first question. And the second question uh, regarding Bangladesh. Actually, I am working long time with Sundarbon mangrove ecosystem, and particularly in Sundarbon, uh, actually Sundarbon the name came from the Sundari tree, and this is the actually this is freshwater loving tree. But gradually, in Indian part almost Sundari is gone, but in Bangladesh also I visited Bangladesh part also. Bangladesh part remnant of Sundari is found in some part, but is rapidly vanishing Sundari because due to salinity is increasing. But the problem is, mainly the Bangladeshi people, they feel like that due to the Farakka Valley. This is the reason. But so far, I have studied, the main reason is the Bombo Kuchpe. Because fresh water is not coming to the Bay of Bengal uh, by constructing many dams by China in Bombo Kuchpe. But very few people in Bangladesh, they are believing that China is not the main culprit. India is the culprit. Then what is the role of India to convince the people? Thank you, sir. Uh, two questions again. The first is, how does the NRC problem impact the relationship between India and Bangladesh? This is something which you just alluded to, uh, maybe explain a bit. And the second is, uh, we are now looking at the problem of climate refugees. So apart from the Rohingya concept, there is also a large number of people who are leaving their land because they can't survive any longer. And this is a problem with the Bay of Bengal in particular. Do you see this also being woven into what you call the strategic partnership between India and Bangladesh? A question not about Bangladesh but about China. Uh, small question because you were a secretary in economic relations. Uh, do you think India benefits if China becomes economically more powerful or less powerful? Sir, forgive our Sir, Bangladesh is showing our Indian cultural relation. टाइम जावा
তাপি দুটো জিওগ্রাফিক্যাল ইনফরমেশন কথা অনেকটাই বললেন এবং কালচারাল এক বা সোশ্যাল স্ট্র্যাটেজিস কথা খুব কম বলেছেন কিন্তু বলেছেন আপনি থাইল্যান্ড एग्जांपल দা দিলেন এটা এবং মিয়ানমার এর एग्जांपल দা দিলেন কিন্তু এই যে एग्जांपल স্ট্রাটেজিটা আছে কিন্তু বাংলাদেশের ক্ষেত্রে আমাদের কিন্তু কালচারাল এবং সোশ্যাল অ্যাফিনিটি অনেক বেশি এবং সেখানে আমরা যে স্ট্র্যাটেজি ব্যবহার করছি সেই স্ট্র্যাটেজির রোলটা কি হতে পারে ইকোনমিক্সের আমি বলে জিওগ্রাফিক্যাল যেটা বলছি কৃষি কিন্তু সোশ্যাল স্ট্র্যাটেজি যেটা রয়েছে সেইটা আমরা সারাক্ষণ ব্যবহার করছি করছি না তা নয় এই যে বাংলাদেশ ভবন যেমন আমাদের সামনে কিন্তু যেটা রয়েছে এবং রবীন্দ্রনাথকে নিয়ে আমরা যেভাবে প্রেজেন্ট করি রবীন্দ্রনাথের যে রিলেশনশিপ বাংলাদেশের সঙ্গে আমাদের মানে রবীন্দ্রনাথ ওদেরও আমাদের এই একটা এমন একটা অ্যাফিনিটি এক্স্যাক্টলি এমন একটা common activity to which have very strong tie and that can be used and that we have been using it is a role that right? that they is a double letter situation the activity of the child to flourish for I'm not sure if I'm wrong for it with the job of interest conflict for that will be to be taken position to not I mean Jordan they will not it is a situation that I mean how do we get over to this kind of thing and when do we balance that's the question I think somebody said both national day of mourning uh, in Bangladesh because the Awami League government, uh, Hasina's father, Hasina and her uh, sister Rehana were the only two survivors of that very brutal assassination. So that is the reason why 1975 things went off track in terms of almost everything, politics, uh, economy and all these things. And politics affects economy. It's very, very good. So that's an answer to your 75. The other thing is Rohingyas. I wrote an article, you can Google it, and said, I wrote that Rohingyas are the world's most unwanted people. Nobody wants them. You know the story in Myanmar, why they don't want them. Bangladeshis, of course, have no choice. They are hosting them. They also don't want them. They are trying to see whether they can be sent back. We are trying to help. China is trying to help. Humanitarian are also trying to tell the Myanmaris they want you can resettle them, take them back. But there is a huge, huge uh, resistance to them going back to Myanmar. And, and, and that resistance is visceral. Visceral money, money, it's very difficult for the, the military and the Myanmarese government, which is half military in any case, uh, to actually overcome. People are not, they just don't want them back. Uh, yeah, this has grown over the years. They, Rohingyas have also made mistakes. You know, the, the usual, you know, the radicalized elements within the Rohingyas have attacked uh, Burmese. In fact, this was triggered off by an attack by the art store, you know, the, the volume of the Arakan, the liberation, something was I mean, all fed through, uh, you know, religious, ideologically kind of extreme, extremism. So, and this was a, this was a response on the man, why is this on this? It was a good opportunity to drive this people out of the business. I don't see any solution. I think they will not go back to Myanmar and Bangladesh will have to bear this burden. And, uh, and I think it's a good eye opener for Bangladesh when they keep denying that there are no illegal migrations to India. So, now you see what happens when people they were, of course, forced to go. It's an illegal kind of movement. So that's my answer. I don't have an answer today to give you that this will be solved. I don't see any solution. <coughs> CPEC, Strategic Calculation and uh, Chapaha. CPEC, as, as I tried to explain hurriedly because there's not much time, is of course China's uh, strategic corridor into the Arabian. And Pakistan is cooperating because they think because of their nexus. Why is China, why do China and Pakistan cooperate? Because of India. And 
with a common enemy, put it like that. Or, and China feels that Pakistan is a good uh, break on India in terms of India's progress or India's sort of rise, etc. That's what they think, strategically. I mean, so. Plus, the strategic part, economic strategic part is to see uh, China has a major worry in terms of its uh, uh, maritime and other things. Which, which we in, in strategic thought is called the Malacca Dialect. Now you know where Malacca is, Straits of Malacca. If you have to go back to the map, because you must look at the map. The Straits of Malacca is the only kind of uh, uh, reasonable uh, maritime route across that southeastern landmass to, to China and to the Far East. To further. The Malacca is a very narrow strait where all the world shipping goes through that. And the Malacca dilemma is, what if, if Malacca Straits are blocked? It can be done. What if the Suez Canal is blocked? Or what if the Straits of Hormuz are blocked? It's in the same category. So China has, has a fear of that, particularly in, a, in, a, in an atmosphere of conflict. So China is seeking alternate access the Arabian Sea and the Bay, which does not go through the land. So that is the CPEC. In terms of India's strategic uh, uh, concerns, uh, um, our problem is that if Pakistan was cooperative, we wouldn't have needed Chaba. It is a compulsion. Because Pakistan does not cooperate in transit or trade. For us, we won't be in Afghanistan, so we now have an air corridor. Uh, and now things are even worse, they've stopped it. Uh, earlier at least some things were going. Uh, Central Asia with which we don't have geographical connectivity except through uh, Pakistan and uh, through Afghanistan. That is also not there. And hence Chabahar was thought of and conceived as a strategic alternative to our trading things to that side. It is not, it is not a, a challenge to the CPEC is a, it is basically finding another route for our, our people to trade, to go, etc., to the Central Asia and to Afghanistan. As you know, we send shipments through Chabahar for food, etc., into Afghanistan. So that is the route we are trying to. It is also part of what is called the North South uh, Trading Corridor, NSTC, which goes right up to Moscow and you know, to Kazakhstan. So that's the land connectivity. That, Sundarban, yes, Sundarban, what you said is, is, is very correct. And the question of salinity growing, and the question of Bangladesh has this habit of criticizing India only and not China. This is ingrained in there. The China can criticize Korea, so India can. Uh, they feel that uh, India is more sensitive and more receptive to criticism than China. And they don't want to annoy China because China has been investing and a lot of money. China is quite good at buying up uh, people, influential people in a uh, Bangladesh is uh, not immune from this uh, from this trend. So you will have, uh, so there is a agreement that we will not criticize China because of the money they are throwing at them. And the silt thing, I am not an expert so I don't know. But Bangladeshis tend to argue that because India is blocking water, and that is why salinity is growing. Because if not fresh, if not fresh water comes in, the saline uh, salinity water goes out. We are trying to do something on track to and things like that. We have an agreement, MOU on environmental protection. And Sundarban is very much a part of it. He hobe and both the because we are still discussing. The track to people are working, the models have been made, all kind of things have been made. We are trying to feed it into the government to look. These are some of the uh, solutions. Not solutions, but basically mitigation and adaptation. I think climate change. The NRC <coughs> impact on bilateral ties. So far, we have managed to tell Bangladesh, we look, this is, we are doing it internally, it has nothing to do with Bangladesh. We are trying to find out how many illegal migrants are in India. We are not saying whether they are Bangladeshis or Myanmaris. This is how so far we have managed to keep them 
not agitated. But they know that ultimately what is the solution. They know that they are illegal migrants from us. Everybody knows. So what is going to happen? In fact, I raised that question in my talk also saying that we really do not know what the government will be doing. There are various solutions are there. Uh, give them work permits, let them continue where they are. Um, after all, they are probably doing some work, adding to our economy, etc. But the mood, the political aspect of it in a sad is very difficult because they want these guys to be thrown out. When you throw out, you know, 30, 40 lakhs of people, how do you do that? You don't live in a world where you can do these things and uh, the world will not look at it. You won't get criticized. So it's a very difficult question. But I think the solutions will have to be found in terms of, uh, first of all, they will be denied all government facilities. Once you become stateless, you don't get any government facility because you're no longer an Indian. So what kind of pressure that will bring on them, I don't know. Some might feel that there's no point now living, let me migrate again somewhere else. That could happen. But I think the bulk of them have nowhere else to go. And they will have to be accommodated somewhere or the other. And how do we do it? We can do it. Work permit system was once discussed at very high levels. But we didn't come to it. Some people felt that work permit would encourage more people. To do it, then there will be an added incentive for them to come. Today, of course, they come illegally, work illegally, whatever it is, and they can manage to survive. In basically menial jobs. I can tell you from Delhi, uh, and I see it every day, all garbage collection is now done by Bangladesh. A job that nobody wants to do anymore. Facts of life. This happens in every country where the immigrants come in at the lowest level of the economic ladder. That's, that's how it happens. Take any country. This is how it happens. And so this is what I, I, I in fact, I talk to them because I'm a Bengali. They will all, I said, I'm here. Kaiser Ali, sir. So Kaiser Ali, what's your name? He said, sir, you're Bihar. Murshidabad. I know he's not from Murshidabad. I can make out from the way he talks. But that's what they say in Delhi. All from West Bengal. They all say I'm from Chokish So this is all over Delhi. I don't know how many thousands, lakhs are working as garbage. But they are providing a very important service. service in Gwarka, they are from Gwarka. And they are from Gwarka. And, uh, but I must say they are providing a very useful service. Garbage collection, garbage sorting. They have been done by them. Climate, refu climate refugees, somebody added on that thing. Well, climate refugees, there is a, there is a book by a Bangladeshi uh, scholar in Oxford who wrote uh, a book called Boundaries Undermined. I think that's the end of the book. I think it's useful if you read that book also. Uh, it basically talks about uh, uprooting of people from the land. And uh, particularly Bangladesh is prone to it as a deltaic region. It happens every year that one village gets washed out, the chore land comes on the other side, and those people have not nowhere to go. Sometimes they are given land on the other side, but many of them migrate. That's one of the reasons. Either they migrate to Dhaka and do something there, or if they are near the border, they tend to come in. Something or get involved in some some activity just to keep themselves alive. So you can call them climate refugees, or you can uh, those are actually you can't call the displaced from chalk lands, etc., climate refugees because this has been going on for ages. I mean, the Ganga changing course, Brahmaputra changing course has been going on for ages. The original Brahmaputra today is a rivulet. And I think 200 years ago, the big change was main Ganga Putra, Brahmaputra is to be a different. Uh, uh, the way it flows down. 
So I think uh, they may not be called climate refugees, but uh, I don't know what you want to call them. But climate refugees is something the Bangladeshis pioneered in, in terms of using this phrase a lot. That, uh, that if you don't uh, give us enough water, then uh, climate refugees will be generated. And uh, where will they go? They will go to India. So you know, kind of build a counter argument and a counter pressure on us. So this is the kind of thing that happened. Would an economically more powerful China uh, be useful for India or not? I think a less economically powerful China would be better for India. And uh, a moderated China would be better. And that is why many in India are very happy that Trump is conducting this trade war with China. Because we, as I said, in this state of flux, India also has opportunities. Because we are trying to build our own manufacturing and other base. Now, I am told that American companies in large numbers are now making inquiries in India, in India. That if we move our factory out of China, can we set it up here? Some of them are doing it. iPhone has already done it. There are many others. You see, we have both benefits and uh, losses in terms of uh, economic relations with China. Uh, today, you half the things you buy are Chinese made. It's cheap. The consumers you know, get a cheap thing, and uh, uh, or your Flipkart and Amazon and all that stuff is. I think I mean, eighty percent must be from China. I think all this stuff. So I have made it a point not to buy something which is made in China, or you can make it a point not to buy things from China. But how do you escape the fact? that 60% uh, of their mobile phone market actually is Chinese. They are manufacturing in India, how people are getting jobs. So once you manufacture in India, we are willing to overlook. I think that, that is the policy, generally. That once you start manufacturing in India, and you are employing thousands of Indians in your thing, then it's fine, it doesn't matter. At least you are getting, job, getting jobs, but you are, you are only exporting and preventing my exports through underhand means, non-tariff barriers, phytosanitary standards, etc., then that is not acceptable. Which is what we are telling the Chinese. Now China is under pressure. Whenever China comes under pressure, its behavior with India improves a lot. And we see it happening all the time. So in my view, from my national and point of interest, it is better that China is put under pressure, its economy suffers then it will see that India can, is, is a good, good country to keep, you know, keep in uh, good humor. So that is the so This is part of balancing cultural ties deposits. Deposit. <coughs> well, I think uh, I, some corner of the Bangladeshi policy maker is a fear of cultural uh, hegemony. That is one of the reasons why Indian movies still cannot be screened publicly in Bangladesh. They are still continuing with that Pakistan law of 1950 something or the other, which does not permit Indian movies from being screened in public, in, you know, in cinema uh, halls. Bangladesh is one of the major capitals of piracy, for example. So you can buy 10 rupees, 10 CDs and see the movie. So everybody is watching the movie and they are influenced by it. I will give you one small example which might explain this issue of hegemony, cultural hegemony. Uh, Bangladesh and India both of test match killed. So, I mean, actually, invited the Taylor Mushnam to be a minister. So, when only a minister, there's three other family channels. So, Pechune, Mushishwan, Mushishwan, Pacha Kachara, Mushishwan. I thought Pacha or Mahi Jishwachi. Je, Ma, to me, Aman Nam Ahmad Kalurak. Does that answer the question? 
Your question about cultural language? I think it does. There is an underlying thing of being swamped by this huge, large, humongous India, which has everything and which we don't. So I think cultural thing, uh, it will be. Not that they can get away. Most of the singers have to come to Kolkata for recording and all that. And I know all of them. And they used to come and give me cassettes. Rather, I see it as a full So, I don't think we should get too worried about it. But I can understand the bureaucratic hassle of doing it. Our, as one very famous minister told me once, I said, why aren't you doing this thing? He says, Dada, how are they talking after the Devanjan and Vishy is your name? So, how many come to the kitchen pocket and throw it in the kitchen? So, how many come to the kitchen pocket and throw it in the kitchen? They used to also acknowledge and, you know, in their sort of, what shall I say, private kind of conversations. So, we understood that. Ilish Machni is a kind of thing. I was a high commissioner. I was desperately trying to get the railways to start the Moitri Express on Poyla Pasha. I have a little bit of a problem with the Chey and the Chey and the Chey. So, I was talking to the Chey and the Chey and the Chey and the Chey and the Chey. I said, I don't know how to get the railway to get the phone. I was talking to the Chey and 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 the Chey. गेला चेस्टा को लग तो देख लग ये जो बहुत अंदर में भी शेड्यूल में फ्लाइट किए तो कर चुका है तब लोग जीस में भी किया था वो तो बोलने था कि सर आपने कास्टर भी तो कर चुके हैं तो वो इकहने दहा कोरी है तो दोनों बाबू के बोलने में की कोरी तो जाओ औरंग की अच्छा बाबू जाओ वो तो इधर जा चुके अगर आपने बोला है तो अगर एयरपोर्ट में नेमेज ही तो शोधा छोड़ जाए शो बोला है तो वह भाषा है पुलिस चैटर्जी स्ट्रीट ना पुलिस चैटर्जी स्ट्रीट इस समथिंग विच इज एम्बेडेड इन माय मेमोरी बिकॉज़ बिकॉज़ माय ग्रैंडफादर अगर व्हेन दे व्हेन दे रीलोकेटेड फ्रॉम ढाका तू कोलकाता ये रेंटेड � now on the winter vacation, I was in Jeta, so in 86, he was in Boris Chaitanji Street. He gave me the car. Boris Chaitanji Street, I knew that. So she lives, she has an original house. So when he said, 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 अच्छा उनके फोन लगाओ तो जेनरल मैनेजर काके की अलग है तो कुछ कुछ तो हमें लगता है कि क्या है जिसको तो भी आपको बोले तो तो बोले तो उसी का चीज़ अभी कागज़ तो थी और पर ये देखो देखो हम लोग पता करते हैं वो ना पेंटिंग नहीं पता वो लोग पेंटिंग फोटोस से आप चाची ना वो but it worked so we managed to run so these kind of things happen you have to do all these things Cultural ties, actor to policy. And what do we do about cultural ties? How do we manage, etc. Of course, we have an Indian cultural sector. We try and uh, accommodate as much as possible within the budget, etc. ICCR, the cultural sector, actually is very active. It's called Indira Gandhi Cultural Sector. Library, Nagpuri, and the Kalpa Library, they go Asena. So it's not. So we're trying to see whether we can do other activities. We take speakers, we take singers, dancers, and the whole year is full of these things. So we maintain that. I am not so worried about cultural ties because I think that is so uh, ingrained in the DNA of both sides that we encourage But I think that is on a, what shall I say, more or less uh, uh, on autopilot. In the sense that there are so many private players doing so many things that 
সরকারের দিক থেকে যে একটা খুব বিরাট ভাবে কিছু একটা করার দরকার নেই এটা আমি আমার বাংলাদেশের সব বাড়িগুলো দেখেছি So that's the kind of uh, activity that goes on mostly. 